So good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Uh, um, I'm uh, Carlo Alfieri. I will be the moderator of this uh, uh, seminar uh, about the treatment uh, of the CKD and BD uh, after kidney transplantation. Uh, we know that uh, mineral uh, and bone uh, diseases, uh, the disorder, uh, are really common during CKD, and uh, uh, some of them are maintained after uh, the kidney transplantation, impacting on the kidney function and the uh, uh, survival of patients. Um, during this seminar, uh, we will review the current options for the treatment uh, of the CKD MBD in this particular setting of uh, patient. And um, this seminar is uh, jointly organized by the SCAT uh, that is represented by uh, Errol Demir uh, as a board member and uh, by the CKD MBD working group of the RA that is represented by myself. Uh, for the participating, uh, uh, they could earn one European credit uh, uh, for their continuous medical education, uh, just for the active AA members. Mm -hmm. uh, to collect them, it's uh, important to uh, attend uh, some uh, um, seconds after the end of the seminar and complete the, man the questionnaire feedback. So our panel uh, today is really uh, of high impact. Uh, we will have a speaker, uh, Hedge Fieldstrom from the University of uh, Norway. She's a transplant nephrologist. And uh, as panelists, uh, we will have uh, Mark Belvold uh, from um, uh, the Netherlands and uh, Errol Demir from the University of Kosh. Uh, was representing the SCAD group, working group. So uh, I asked to Hedge to start uh, uh, her presentation, um, sharing uh, her screen. So, uh, dear organizers, I thank you for the opportunity to speak about this important topic in post-transplant care. Except from having received speakers' fees from these companies, I have no disclosures. Now, the concept of chronic kidney disease, mineral and bone disorder, CKD MBD, was invented in 2007 and seek to underline the strong relationship between disturbances in mineral metabolism, bone abnormalities, and vascular or other soft tissue calcification. And together, these derangements are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, fracture, and mortality. Now, with reduced GFR, responses to compensate for this uh, reduced phosphate excretion start early in CKD. Uh, there is a produced FGF23 from bone tissue, which then inhibits the conversion of calciferiol to calcitriol in the kidney, leading to reduced tubular phosphate reabsorption. But while this temporarily restores phosphate balance, it happens at the cost of reduced uh, calcium reabsorption. And this leads to increased production of PTH. And with a long-standing hyperparathyroidism, the bone tissue may develop some PTH resistance and also vitamin D receptors and calcium sensing receptors in the parathyroid glands are successively lost. And this is quite important for understanding the post-transplant hyperparathyroidism as well. Now, adding further complexity to the picture, vitamin D deficiency is common in progressing CKD. Symmetrical gland hyperplasia may be followed by transition to monoclonal PTH producing adenomas, which do not listen to regulatory signals, and hypercalcemia tends to develop at this stage. Even though the regulatory hormones I spoke about here keep calcium and phosphate within normal range until late stages of CKD, it comes with a cost. Elevated FGF23 and PTH have both been associated with negative outcomes especially cardiovascular disease. There is disturbed bone metabolism in almost all long-term dialysis patients. A bone biopsy may reveal different forms of renal osteodystrophy, and until some decades ago, osteitis fibrosa cystica, caused by PTH-driven high bone turnover, was the most common form. Nowadays, however, a dynamic bone disease with suppressed bone turnover and low bone volume is becoming the most common lesion in late CKD. 
and this is thought to be the consequence of increased use of PTH lowering treatments. Now, mixed bone pathology may be seen in some patients, and osteomalacia is a mineral mineralization defect that is most often due to long standing vitamin D deficiency, and it may lead to softening of bone tissue, bone pain, and also reduced bone strength. Vascular calcification is a process characterized by thickening and loss of, loss of elasticity of muscular artery walls. It is a strong predictor of cardiovascular risk, and the media calcification is the case in progressing CKD MBD. This is triggered by high levels of PTH, phosphate, and calcium, as well as other factors like chronic inflammation, which is quite common in uremia. There is a transition of the smooth muscle cells in uh, into osteoblast-like cells, which are building up hydroxyapatite in the vessel wall. So what happens to mineral and bone balance after kidney transplant? In this study by Wolf and colleagues, patients were classified by pre-transplant PTH above or below 300 picograms per mil. And this abrupt reduction in the high PTH group does not uh, um, indicate real regression of hyperparathyroidism, but removal of PTH fragments with better kidney function. From these graphs, you see that PTH goes down, but does not fully normalize. And untreated, as many as 86% of patients are actually reported to have some elevation of PTH at one year after transplant. Calcium levels often uh, peak at uh, six to eight weeks due to efficient PTH-driven conversion of calcifediol to calcitriol in this now functional renal tubules. And this overdrive uh, may also lead to exaggerated vitamin D deficiency, which is actually seen in up to 80% of patients by three months after transplant. FGF23 generally rapidly decreases after transplant. But there is a phase here of hypophosphatemia, which is very frequent in the time before uh, FGF23 is normalized. And it may persist for longer in persistent hyperparathyroidism. And lastly, immunosuppressive drugs may also in increase hypophosphatemia. Before we go to the effect on bone in more detail, we should bear in mind that disturbances in calcium, phosphate, and PTH may have negative effects on graft function. In this study from 10 years ago, high calcium together with low phosphate, which is this line, uh, was associated with the worst GFR slope over the first year post-transplant. And this figure shows predicted change in eGFR over the first 12 months for each of these four combinations of mineral levels. In a postdoc analysis from the ALERT study, our group showed uh, hyperparathyroidism to be associated with graft loss and all-cause mortality, independent of the mineral levels. And then recently, another study confirmed such an association in normal calcemic uh, transplant recipients with hyperparathyroidism. Our patients come to transplant with high rates of osteopenia and osteoporosis, renal osteodystrophy, diabetes, dialysis treatments, corticosteroid use before transplant are all factors that predispose for osteoporosis on top of the general risk factors. Glucocorticoids have a negative impact on trabecular bone and also persistent hyperparathyroidism in the post-transplant period has been associated with increased cortical and trabecular bone losses, especially in the first year. And the low phosphate levels may impair bone mineralization. So the net effect of these exposures are a resorption of bone tissue followed by an increased risk of osteoporosis and fractures. In the long run, risk of osteoporosis and fracture is most dependent on graft function and whether FGF23 and PTH starts rising again. And lastly, we must not forget the increased risk in patients who are prone to falling. Now, reducing steroid exposure can minimize bone loss, and both early and late withdrawal is shown to improve BMD. In this study, you see that there's an analysis of American Renal Registry data where early steroid withdrawal was associated with a 31% reduced risk of fracture in the first five years. 
When treating CKD and BD after transplant, we aim to avoid bone loss and osteomalacia, and we want to control persistent hyperparathyroidism and treat osteoporosis. The optimal level of calcifediol after transplant is not established, but in our center, we strive to maintain levels above 50 nanomoles per liter. And this should be throughout the year, and we give native vitamin D supplements. In our experience, aiming higher, which the endocrinologist wants us to do, will often cause hypercalcemia in a number of patients. Calcitriol and VDRAs lower PTH and ameliorate hypophosphatemia and is shown to improve BMD early after transplant. But again, some patients develop uh, uh, unacceptable hypercalcemia. So the off-label use of calcium emetics may control both hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. But somewhat disappointingly, there's no reliable evidence for improvement in BMD with cynical set treatment. And then I'll come back to the anti-resorptives uh, somewhat later. There is an ongoing discussion if calcium emetics or the more definite option of para parathyroidectomy is the best solution for treating persistent hyperparathyroidism after transplant. And also what level uh, should, uh, should cause us to start to treat. Calcium emetics uh, have insufficient effects in some patients. The PTH and the calcium may uh, remain a bit elevated. Uh, also, as I said, it doesn't really improve BMD. And there is digestive side effects that may limit dose and at least limit dose increments. Uh, p parathyroidism, uh, parathyroidectomy, uh, sorry, uh, will uh, lead to hungry bone syndrome postoperatively in most patients. And uh, these patients need to have intravenous calcium supplements and lots of vitamin D supplements. And there may be quite a big shifts in the mineral levels postoperatively. Um, there's also risks of surgical complications like uh, some vocal cord uh, lesions and hypoparathyroidism. And the risk of relapse is actually up to one third after parathyroidectomy. Uh, there's been some concern with both treatments uh, for the risk of adynamic bone disease. And this is mostly due to the fact that we don't know what is the ideal PTH level after transplant. Um, as I told you in the beginning, there is a PTH resistance in the skeleton and also there is changes in the receptors in the parathyroid glands, which uh, indicates that there might not be uh, very helpful to have very low uh, PTH after transplant. Also, there may be negative effects on graft function, which has been uh, done some research about, but this meta-analysis by Frey and uh, colleagues show that um, there's really no really big difference between uh, parathyroidectomy and cynical set when it comes to serum creatinine after uh, these treatments. One should postpone surgery until 12 months after transplant to allow for maximum shrinkage of glands. Also, uh, we want to have a stabilized transplant function before going into surgery. This recent publication by Dista Ban Chong and collaborators present a flowchart that may be used for the management of post-transplant hyperparathyroidism. Surgery before 12 months after transplant is only considered in case of severe hypercalcemia, rapid bone loss, fracture, or kidney stones. While calcium emetics may be introduced uh, after 3 to 12 months um, if there's a hypercalcemia and progressive increase in PTH. If moderate uh, hypercalcemia after one year, calcium emetics could be continued, while normal calcemic slight to moderate hyperparathyroidism could be observed and monitored for complications. And the candidates for surgery would be those with the highest PTH and calcium levels, particularly those with signs of ongoing bone loss, um, uh, even if they're on calcium emetics. Some decades ago, the immediate post-transplant weeks were considered detrimental to bone health, but modern immunosuppressive regimens contain less corticosteroids than before, resulting in relatively stable bone mass in the central skeleton. Still worsening BMD at the peripheral sites continues to be seen in our patients, and there is considerable ind individual variation in bone strength at the time a patient comes into transplant. 
This quite recent observational registry study of almost 4,000 patients in Sweden found five-year fracture rate to be 7.4%, with almost half of the fractures uh, in the forearm. Among the clinical risk factors they found for fracture were diabetes nephropathy, pre-transplant dialysis therapy, and acute rejection. Most fractures occurred in the first six months, and having a fracture in the hip or spine increased risk of death substantially. So we have the demographic risk factors, but how may we further identify kidney transplant recipients with high risk of fracture? In addition to evaluating demographic risk factors and comorbidities, we'd like to gain information about actual bone strength. The gold standard for discriminating the different forms of osteodystrophy is bone biopsy, but the method is invasive and considerable experience is needed from the, the pathologist. And in Scandinavia, where I live, uh, bone biopsy is not routinely available, so we'll have to rely on other tools. The Fracture Risk Assessment Tool, FRAX, is a calculator that estimates an individual's 10-year probability of suffering a hip or other major osteoporotic fracture, and it is calibrated by geographical region. It is frequently used in the general practice, but data on its usefulness in kidney transplant recipients is quite scarce. This study comparing the observed 10-year fracture rate in kidney transplant recipients with the estimated risk from FRAX found a rather good correlation, both with and without inclusion of BMD data. Measurements of BMD by DEXA scan is the most used tools to assess fracture risk. Using the WHOT score cutoffs, uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis at the hip and spine predicted fracture in a few important prospective studies in kidney transplant recipients, here shown by, exemplified by the study by Evnopol. There is, however, considerable individual variation in the development of bone density over the first transplant year. Here you see a recent study by Meng uh, showing how uh, the, there is a change in lumbar spine, total hip and femoral neck over the first year. And you might want to know if your patient is up here with a, a high positive change or down here. So to know which course your patient follows, serial DEXA scans seem justified. Several new tools may be applied to the conventional DEXA scan. And I will point to the trabecular bone score, which uses grayscale interpretation of pixels from the lumbar spine images. It has been incorporated into newer versions of FRAX and it predicts a fracture independent of BMD in the general population. In this study by Naylor, long-term incidence of fractures were studied in 327 kidney transplant recipients. And the patients were divided into TBS above or below median and the fracture-free proportion were significantly higher in patients who had higher TBS. So there seemed to be some added knowledge to this uh, tool. Markers of bone turnover may be useful supplements to DEXA scans, and those with less renal excretion are the most useful. From this study by Jorgensen, in both transplant candidates and recipients, you see that level of these four BTMs correlate with biopsy findings of low, normal, and high uh, bone turnover. The highest diagnostic performances is seen if you combine different biomarkers and the use of biomarker panels may thus be the best approach in the future. Bone turnover markers may predict short-term changes in BMD, but we do not know yet if they associate with long-term fracture risk. So which are our treatment options? We must not forget that calcitriol has been shown to prevent bone loss especially in the first year. And we must make sure the patient is not in negative calcium balance and consider supplements to those with a low calcium diet. Then the repertoire of osteoporosis treatments consists of the antiresorptive agents and the neuroanabolic agents. Bisphosphonates are the most widely studied treatments for post-transplant bone disease. They increased BMD by suppressing bone turnover through inhibiting osteoclast function. We know that uh, bisphosphonates may improve BMD, but evidence of effect on fracture rate is scarce. And this is due to the heterogeneous studies 
with quite a short follow-up. Very little is known beyond 12 months. There has been worry about side effects. For example, intravenous bisphosphonates have been associated with acute kidney injury. And due to the potential risk of inducing adynamic bone disease, there's been much controversy regarding the use of bisphosphonates after kidney transplantation. Uh, Marques and uh, colleagues performed the largest trial to date, concluding that solidronic acid does not trigger adynamic bone disease. The rank ligand inhibitor, denosumab, does not accumulate in reduced renal function and may be given independent of GFR. Bonani and colleagues in the only uh, RCT on denosumab showed that denosumab increased BMD and TBS in the first year after kidney transplantation. And a few observational studies have actually later confirmed these findings. The main concern with denosumab is hypocalcemia, which might be most pronounced between two weeks and two months after administration. And unfortunately, there's no sustained effect. Uh, if the drug is paused without transition to an alternative antiresorptive like a bisphosphonate, there is a higher incidence of atypical fractures. And also that the effect of the nosumab on fracture risk post-transplant has not yet been established. Now to the anabolic agents, uh, teripyrotide, uh, pulsatile treatments with injections of this uh, PTH analog has a net anabolic effect on osteoblasts. It increases BMD and reduced fracture risk in postmenopausal osteoporosis and in steroid-induced osteoporosis. But we have only one small interventional study of patients uh, who has received a kidney transplant, and there were 26 patients uh, in this, and the, uh, the result was negative for effect on BMD. The drug is expensive and quite cumbersome to administer, so until we have more evidence, its use is probably limited to patients with adynamic bone disease who are not candidates for other agents. In primary osteoporosis, romososumab, which is a sclerostin inhibitor, reduced vertebral fractures markedly with a more pronounced effect than bisphosphonates. And this might be because it has a dual effect. It's all, both uh, antiresorptive and anabolic. However, there's been signals of increased cardiovascular risk in two large studies, and so far there's been no studies in CKD or transplant recipients. But in the post hoc analysis of the larger registration studies, it actually seems that patients with lower GFRs had somewhat poorer effect of uh, romososumab than the rest. There's also a concern that blocking sclerostin might increase vascular calcification in patients with reduced GFR, as sclerostin has, uh, the, all, all the effects of sclerostin has not been elucidated. So current guidelines are vague when it comes to treatment of osteoporosis after kidney transplant. BMD should be measured if results will alter therapy, okay. Uh, and in the first year, patients with low BMD and a good graft function may be treated with native or active vitamin D or antiresorptives. We should choose our treatments based on mineral and hormone levels, and bio bone biopsy is suggested if available. But after 12 months, we don't know what to do then, and we really don't know what to do with patients with lower GFR than 30 mil per minute. I've chosen to show uh, this risk-based approach to CKD MBD in kidney transplant recipients published in CJSON 2023 because it's quite similar to what we uh, practice in Norway for the moment. First, we will look at the life's possible lifestyle interventions and all our patients have to uh, exercise with physiotherapists quite eagerly uh, in the beginning. We look at biochemical assessments and uh, all patients who are low in vitamin D levels will get uh, supplements. But not all can tolerate this. Uh, if you move to this group uh, or these groups, uh, some patients have uh, hypercalcemia uh, with or without uh, elevated uh, PTH. And then you need to hold the vitamin D uh, at least for, for the beginning. Patients who have uh, rising PTH levels and hypercalcemia, uh, we will, unless it's just uh, slightly uh, elevated calcium, we would choose a calcium emetic. Phosphate uh, 
can be really low and uh, very often it's asymptomatic. Uh, if the levels go lower than 0 0.4, we will uh, give either phosphate rich foods uh, or supplementations and it's also possible to use calcium emetics. Then uh, at six uh, weeks after transplant, we will do a DEXA scan in all patients for fracture risk assessment. And if the T-score is less than minus 2.5 or the patient has had a low energy fracture, we'll move down to this box. We look at the PTH level, but we know that the PTH is only uh, able to predict bone turnover in the uh, margins, so the, the very high or the very low uh, levels. So I have uh, started measuring more often bone specific, uh, no, um, bone specific alkalic phosphatase and um, P1 and P to be more sure about whether there is a high or a low bone turnover. If uh, markers are high, uh, we will give an antiresorptive agent and we will uh, prioritize bisphosphonates to those with a high GFR and use denosumab in those with lower GFRs. If the, um, the turnover is low, uh, you may choose an anabolic agent, but personally, I don't have much uh, experience with these drugs yet. In a recent publication looking at practical management of CKD MBD after transplant, Elder suggests establishing dedicated multidisciplinary bone clinics. He also suggests that we consider hormone replacement therapy to patients with estrogen and testosterone deficiency, if no contraindications. This is not something that we do regularly in our center, but we will, uh, of course, measure uh, these, um, these hormones uh, if there's specific cases. Uh, his center has also developed a transplant specific score for fracture risk and used this score together with bone uh, mineral density, bone turnover markers, and fracture history to decide on treatment. He'll give antiresorptives uh, if the resorption markers are high, if there's a fragility fracture, uh, if there's a high um, fracture risk score. But some patients with uh, more normal findings would have calcitriol or analogs. There's no consensus on how to treat osteoporosis in kindred transplant recipients with a low GFR. Most centers would refrain from initiating a bisphosphonate in this, these patients, and the risk of exaggerating hypercalcemia could complicate the use of denosumab in the later stages of CKD after transplant. Uh, though not developed for transplant recipients, this consensus paper from Evanapol and colleagues on treatment of osteoporosis in late stages of CKD might be useful. When it comes to bone active treatment, they recommend weighing the pros and cons in each patient before making an individualized decision together with the patient. So coming up to the summary, CKD, MBD affect not only bone strength, but also renal function and cardiovascular health. Modern treatment regimens with less steroids have reduced bone loss and fractures after kidney transplantation. Some patients still have high fracture risk and must be identified and offered treatment. The optimal level of PTH after kidney transplant is not known and probably individual. Calcium emetics ameliorate hypercalcemia and lower PTH, but may fail to protect bone integrity. Antiresorptive treatment improves BMD after transplant, but effect on fracture risk is less established. The anabolic agents may be an alternative in severe bone loss or low bone turnover. And the treatment choices should, of course, be individualized. The, it is probably a good idea with a multidisciplinary approach to investigations and treatments. And uh, at our center, we have a close collaboration with the, the endocrinologist in selected patients and also when we uh, form um, guidelines that are used. So I will just end with showing these Norwegian suggestions uh, that we have developed at our center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hedge. Uh, really, really a good presentation full uh, of really important concept. And um, effectively, we, we have a lot of questions. Uh, and I also have some questions for you, uh, but maybe we could start uh, uh, with um, with the Errol if uh, he wants to 
to comment or uh, ask you something. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for the nice, nice presentation, Hege. The topic is quite extensive and en encompassing not only mineral and board disorders, and but also vascular calcification, cardiovascular events, and mortality. Ongoing research is actively exploring new biomarkers related to this field, such as serum calcification pro propensity T50 score, I know, Hege, you are in ex experience some of the research on this field and radiofrequency echocardiographic multispectrometry for assessing bone turnover. On the other hand, biomarkers is still needed on the detection of the quality of the bone and assessing the vascular calcification. Uh, currently, a number of uh, drugs are utilized for the treating CKD and BD. Although these drugs are better on the controlling of the mineral metabolism, but there is a lack of the treatment options for the preventing of osteoporosis. Also, there is a, remains a pressing need for the curative treatments, especially in cases of low uh, turnover bone diseases and vascular calcification. Additionally, further research is required to shed light on the mechanism behind bone turnover and develop strategies to inhibit vascular calcification. Thank you, uh, Carlo, and thank you, Hege, for your uh, nice presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, Hedge, do you want to comment something? Um, I didn't get really what was the most important of these questions, but uh... I think uh, one of the challenges uh, in uh, the the low bone turnover versus the high bone turnover is that we, without a bone biopsy, we have uh, only surrogate markers uh, to to show for us at the moment, and uh, especially the hyperparathyroidism. Uh, our research has shown that there is um, systemically probably not good to have high PTH, but when it comes to the bone, it is probably uh, better to have slightly elevated PTH due to the skeletal resistance. So I'm a bit worried that it's difficult to find the perfect line uh, due to the fact that what is best for the bone might not be best for the, the vasculature. Um, so this is one thing that I'm concerned about at the moment, and we really need more research on, on this. Because according to the study that we did, we should, since it's a uh, high PTH is associated with um, with graft loss and mortality, we should want to to lower PTH at uh, any cost. But then again, low bone turnover might be the the result. That was just one of the questions of Errol, but uh, there were many, so maybe someone else can comment as well. Yes, I, I totally, I totally agree with, with you. If I, if I can tell something um, about the control of PTH in transplant patients, uh, do, we should not forget that uh, also, even if our patient have uh, has one or one point two of creatinine, it doesn't mean that uh, he has a normal renal function. Uh, a very good transplant. Uh, in the best uh, of the surgery of the of the transplant center has uh, almost 60 70 of uh, gfr so it means that uh, a, a, a a small kind of ckd is present uh, in them so I, I i totally agree with you that probably we should personalize the the uh, the levels of a PTH in those patients uh, um, uh, without be a, a afraid to normalize it, but uh, uh, but considering that probably they don't have a normal renal function, so the risk of that dynamic bone disease is present. And just to to follow this uh, this uh, uh, this concept, uh, we have some questions from the in the question and uh, answers that uh, I didn't answer because uh, uh, are all, all of them are really interesting. Uh, and uh, I would ask uh, uh, to you uh, one uh, one question in your clinical practice. Okay, how do you evaluate? 
the uh, the bone straight. What what I mean is uh, uh, is uh, an evaluation that you make before the transplant, uh, in, when you put the, your patient in waiting list, and how does it uh, uh, affect the uh, approach to the post transplant period in terms of both of uh, uh, immunosuppressive regimens and, for example, of uh, uh, instrumental uh, approach after transplantation. Uh, if we start at uh, patients coming into transplants, uh, since we work at the National Transplant Center, uh, we get uh, lots of information on every patient when we uh, approve them as candidates. And if we have tertiary hyperparathyroidism in patients with very high PTH, we will very often recommend uh, more now than before probably to do uh, a, a scanning to check if uh, they have adenoma and maybe go through with parathyroidectomy at that stage. Uh, because um, personally, we have experienced that uh, some patients who receive this parathyroidectomy later for this tertiary hyperparathyroidism, they uh, get a lower uh, GFRs and the, it, it seems not so neutral as the research says for the graft function. Uh, and uh, also we could expect that uh, when they're waiting for one or two or three years and have a tertiary hyperparathyroidism, they will be worse off with their skeleton when they come into transplant. So that's one thing that we are, uh, are saying to, to them when uh, we approve for transplant that maybe you should consider the surgery before. Uh, also, uh, unfortunately, they don't always have DEXA scans before they come in, so it might be a surprise to us when they have the first DEXA scan where they're at. And generally, mm. we can see that those who have multiple transplants, um, in Norway at least, there hasn't been a very uh, forward-leaning um, attitude towards bone uh, in the previous decades. So many haven't even had DEXA scans uh, previously, and we see that young patients may at 25 may even have really, really bad skeletons. So this knowledge about the history, how much immunosuppression and uh, steroids they've had, of course, will, will be something we can we bring into the post-transplant setting. Um, when we have them post-transplant, we get this information about the DEXA. And we also, when I make decisions, I will also always look at the whole history of uh, parathyroidism, hyperparathyroidism. And uh, if they have a uh, cynical set when they come into, hyper, uh, into to transplant, we will um, very seldom take it away. We'll, we'll ask them to, to keep using it after transplant because we see that they usually get very high levels uh, in the first months. So uh, I collect as much knowledge as I can, actually. And uh, then I don't see the, we don't see the patients after one year. So we have been, uh, my knowledge is, is mostly in the first year after mm -hmm. transplant. Someone else could probably say more uh, about uh, the later period. Thank you very much. I don't know if Mark wants to, to comment or to yeah, make yeah. a question. Thank you, Carla, shortly, uh, because I noticed there are a lot of questions uh, incoming. So, Heike, thank you very much. Also, from my side, this was a wonderful overview. I have one question and one remark for you. Um, the, the remark is that usually we can mitigate the risk of hypocalcemia due to denosumab if we supplement vitamin D beforehand. And my question is that I noticed that in the CJSON publication, there was no role for the FREX score. And I noticed that you advocate to do DEXA scans in all. I am aware of the fact that it has only been one study in post-transplant that looked at FREX, so that needs external validation. But do you think it would be reasonable to perform DEXA scans only in people who have a high FREX score? Uh I think uh, if when we get more uh, knowledge about the FRAX and if it actually seems to predict fracture, it would be uh, possible to limit the DEXA scans and, and use the FRAX more uh, because it's, of course, much less resource demanding. But uh, I don't think we're there yet. I wouldn't, I still think that we need more information from the DEXA. And also, since we have these new tools, not only the trabecular bone score, but maybe also the cortical, uh, the hip cortical thickness uh, scores, and, and we can get quite a lot out of it. So I think 
it is too early to move over to, to a reductionist uh, approach with FRAX, but maybe later when we have more data. Thank you. Car Carlo, can I ask one more question to Hagen? Uh, I don't know. You have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, Hagen, you mentioned that the first line treatment uh, might be calcium trial with calcium. Uh, didn't you mean uh, nutritional vitamin D with calcium instead? Um, we would use the nutritional vitamin D first. And uh, if the patient has a graft function, which is uh, around 30 milliliters per minute, we would also expect them to need some active vitamin D as well. So then we would combine the bo both. Yes. But of course, frequently there is hypercalcemia, which is yeah. a problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have really two, I, I think, practical, interesting question um, uh, from um, Professor Evenepole and Bover. Uh, the first one is: if if you routinely estimate calcium in, calcium intake in transplant recipients, and I can add to this uh, uh, to these uh, questions uh, also um, my question: if you evaluate or if you think that it could be useful to evaluate the urinary excretion of uh, calcium in those patients. Uh, and this is the first, uh, the, the first question. The other question about the therapy um, is uh, uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the denosumab and the bisphosphonate. And so do you prefer zoendronate or alendronate? Uh, in a patient considered eligible for bisphosphonate, and uh, if you have experience, um, we have some experience, but we can compare uh, about the uh, potential uh, effect of the nosma in increasing uh, the UTIs. Um, since my memory is quite short, could you take one at a time, and I'll try to answer. Yeah. The the first is uh, if you routinely estimate calcium intake, and I asked mm. about the urine also. Mm. Uh, we we don't routinely do it, but I actually learned from Evanopol that it might be very wise to do so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after having listened to him speak about this, and the the that we probably uh, give too little calcium to patients because we're afraid of vascular calcification, I have started at least uh, to include these questions uh, when I have patients that I start treating. But we haven't come that far as to, to do it routinely. No, not yet. But um, it is a very good idea to do because I think we are keeping many patients in too low calcium balance. Okay. And uh, the second one uh, was about... Uh... Uh, bisphosphonates and the nosumab. So, if you prefer zolendronate, alendronate, yeah. and what is your experience uh, in the um, uh, UTIs with mm. the nosumab? Mm. Yeah. When it comes to the nosumab versus uh, bisphosphonates, um, let's say you have a, a CKD patient which has been treated with the nosumab before transplant, uh, and uh, I would then switch them to um, a bisphosphonate. This is mainly due to the fact that there are a bit less uh, data on the long-term uh, effects of the nosumab still, but probably uh, more importantly, it's a practical thing that if you do quit the nosumab, there's really a one-way tunnel where you have this increased risk, but you may consolidate uh, the treatment of the nosumab with a bisphosphonate, and then you can take a pause. So it's easier to get off the treatment when you have um, achieved uh, better uh, T-scores when you used bisphosphonates. So in, in good kidney function, I would actually do this transition. I, I know this was also a question that we got in writing. And then when it comes to what bisphosphonates to give, there is, of course, a bit bigger um, uh, risk of uh, acute kidney disease with the, the intravenous um, bisphosphonates. Uh, but our endocrinologist uh, is quite convinced that the effects of the intravenous is quite much higher, and probably it's due to lower uh, adherence on the, the oral formulations. Uh, so what I would do is that if it's if the renal function is, um, is uh, a bit compromised, uh, I would at least do the, the oral instead of the intravenous. And uh, I would not give those patients who have a lot of dyspepsia and problems with taking lots of drugs uh, and strive, 
and has, for example, um, inflammation of the esophagus, I would not do the oral treatment. Um, and sometimes I've actually tried to give uh, half the dose or one, one two thirds of the dose of bisphosphonates if I'm a, a bit skeptical um, for the, a cluster of three milligrams, for example. Uh, the risk of UTIs, I don't really have any practical experience uh, with patients uh, having more of those. So I, I don't think I should be the one to comment on, on that. Yeah, uh, um, what is my experience is that um, obviously uh, selecting patients that are not contaminated by bacterial in the, mm. in the urine, uh, we didn't find a, a significant increase of UTIs uh, in the patient treated with, uh, with the nosobab. I, I don't know if, if maybe Mark uh, and uh, Errol uh, has, some, uh, has, has some experience to share about this, uh, this concept. No, no, not about the UTI, but we do have a way to look at the effects of oral bisphosphonate just by measuring bone turnover markers because it's nicely declining if the uptake and the bioavailability is good. Mm. And this leads, well, then you don't have the burden to treat with IV. And I'm aware that you can do it uh, every month or sorry, every year. Yeah. But bone turnover markers can be quite helpful to study not only adherence, but also the bioavailability of the oral compounds. And, and there are a lot of questions about the early period after transplantation. I, I will try to summarize them. Uh, so the first one is uh, uh, if it makes sense to use bisphosphonase immediately after the transplantation, uh, to limit uh, the uh, the early bone loss uh, uh, by steroids, and uh, if you wanted to answer to this, yeah. I, I find the others. I I can do that in, in the beginning. We actually um, we have performed a study uh, some years ago in our center, the Bonviva uh, trial, where we tried to prevent bone loss by giving bisphosphonates very early after transplant. And what was surprisingly then was that. Uh, the bone loss in the placebo group, who did only get uh, vitamin D and, uh, and calcium and no bisphosphonate, it was much less than we believed. Uh, and with those uh, low steroid protocols that are used now, uh, and even the protocols without steroids, there seemed to be a much less bone loss than earlier decades. So I don't think that a one-size-fits-all strategy with bisphosphonates uh, in the early days would be necessary or or, or have benefit enough uh, to to use no and and with patients that uh, are taking the nosumab in the early period uh, will you continue it uh, or will you shift to, to bisphosphonate or you, you will stop it no i, I would is... um i would look at the dexa scan at six weeks and if the treatment that they have been given before with the nosumab uh, has been very efficient and they they are uh, have a good uh, a be better maybe only osteopenic levels i would probably give one dose to consolidate the treatment as you shouldn't stop the nosumab uh, then you should should give something else otherwise there's increased risk of fracture so i would give one yeah. dose of bisphosphonates and i would then uh, maybe not give the next dose until i had uh, done the one year scan and then uh, also measured the, the bone turnover markers to see whether they should have a new dose. And the other point uh, in the early uh, post-transplant period uh, is the problem of hypophosphatemia. That is something uh, who struck us uh, uh, during the, the KDGO conference uh, in, in September. But uh, uh, in the end, uh, are you, are you give to patient uh, phosphate or uh, you wait? What is your approach? Because there are no guidelines about that. No, no, no. And all of us is, is free yeah. to do. Um, we, uh, we, there's one economic aspect and that is that since we cannot prove uh, that there is any um, uh, hard endpoints that we can can uh, um, prevent with giving phosphates, uh, we cannot give this to patients without them paying 
quite a lot of money or we have to to buy it into the hospital so there's no reimbursement for the, the phosphate treatments and patients are asymptomatic so what we do is in the early period when they're very much in-house we will give uh, phosphate for levels lower than 0 0.4 0 0.5 because uh, then we expect that at least that it might be some some um, uh, problems with mineralization of the bone uh, and maybe also uh, constituent symptoms. But uh, we quite quickly take that away and we're, we're accepting 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 without doing anything actually. But can I help in? Uh, so why is the threshold to use calcium emetic so high in this setting? Because this hypophosphatemia is due to hyperphosphaturia, which we improve if you use calcium emetics. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know why we haven't started doing that. Uh, I, I'm quite eager to, to use it for uh, hyperparathyroidism in patients who I know have tertiary uh, hyperparathyroidism. But I've also used it sometimes uh, merely for the phosphate, but I feel that I'm going really out of the guidelines. So um, do you use, uh, to ask you back, uh, are you using it routinely uh, to get the phosphate up? No. Not to get the phosphate up. Uh, so uh, honestly speaking, we we don't use uh, uh, calcium emetics to this aim, uh, but for for other other points. Also because the hypophosphatemia, the strong hyper hypophosphatemia, is really related to the high levels of F FGF twenty three and maybe also uh, from the high levels of PTH that uh, if for example, calcium is permissive, uh, permissive uh, can be managed with, uh, for example, vitamin D. And so uh, in, in this case, yeah. but uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Mark also has a, some experience about that, but we don't use the, the calcium with this, with this aim. Well, it depends on the period of the transplantation. Yeah, obviously. So if it's in the in the early stages, I think it's okay to give phosphate supplements. But it's important to remember, and everybody knows that, that if you give phosphate, it's a trigger for PTH and for FGF23. Absolutely. Our calcium mimetics suppress both. Absolutely. And uh, and uh, there is a... Uh, uh, there is a, a, a good comment about uh, Professor Van Opel, uh, who says that, that the great challenge is the identification uh, of the transplant patient uh, who will benefit most from bone targeted drugs. Mm. And unfortunately, I, I'm telling unfortunately because, in my opinion, bone turnover markers uh, probably is the best. Uh, compromise that we have actually but it's it should not the final uh, guide um, uh, so monitoring bone turnover markers could be useful and are you using them in your clinical practice so my question is if you are taking clinical decision according to the bone just to the bone uh, turnover markers and i want to add a question to your question okay Hello, uh, yeah, I see some yes. of the papers about the T50 score. Uh, what do you think about this score? Is it beneficial to use? Because I think that it's a, a easily me measured in the blood. Do you see any? Uh, um, hmm. We haven't done the T50 outside research purposes, but we have done it in quite a few research studies. And I, I, I agree with you, it's very tempting to uh, supplement the the the, the normal bind, um, bone turnover markers with T50 as well, because it can tell you something about risk of, of a vascular calcification, uh, not only the, the health of the bone. Um, but um, it's quite expensive and it's not in clinical routine at our place yet. But I'm hoping that it may be available and that more studies will will uh, give us the opportunity to to put it into this puzzle of uh, of how to to give individualized treatments. Um, when it comes to using the bone turnover markers, um, I'm sitting here at one center seeing all the transplant patients at the very same times. So I have started. Uh, ordering th these uh, not routinely in all because we haven't got there yet, 
um, but um, I'm um, uh, negotiating with the bosses about it. Um, but I use it in patients that I think uh, I would want more information about to make a clinical decision. Yes. And uh, then uh, I think it's very useful and it gives me, if I feel that I'm uh, indecisive about whether to start a uh, bone active treatment or not, uh, I feel that they can give me some um, extra um security that I'm not uh, at least uh, giving them something that's bad for them. And th then I, I do, as I said in the presentation, of course, we have PTH, but uh, I would look at the, the normal alkalic phosphatase, which can be used quite well when they don't have liver disease. And I would order bone specific bone alkal uh, alkalic phosphatase and the P1 and P. CTX1 is a bit more difficult to use in, um, in the reduced renal function. Absolutely, I, I I totally agree with you. Um, uh, let me check. Uh, I don't know if Mark and Daryl wants to comment uh, or. Uh, what is it? Yeah, one one thing I want to bring up is that uh, you mentioned Hege that the you the presence of what you termed a dynamic bone disease might be. Uh, might lead to some hesitation to use calcium emetics, but I think it's it's important. And actually, this is the point Carlo told me that we must make a difference between a dynamic bone disease and low bone turnover. And I think if you induce lower bone turnover, this is something completely different than a dynamic bone disease. Yeah, we are from. Uh, sorry. No, no, you no, first. Go. No, 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 no. Go, go, go. <laughs> No, I just said that um, these are the cases where you would really want to have the bone biopsy, you know, to, to have a even better uh, knowledge about each patient, not only uh, the guessing. Um, but uh, I am personally using quite much calcium emetics and uh, I uh, believe that uh, even though it's still off label, uh, it's um, when looking Oh, I don't know how to say this in English, <laughs> but the, the, the evidence uh, seem to be uh, good enough to uh, advocate for lowering PTH in many of these patients in, the, in the, the first year. I don't really know how long we should go on using the calcium emetics uh, in, in patients with just slightly uh, elevated PTH, those with persistent hyperparathyroidism after one or two years. Uh, I would love to know have more long-term data on that. Absolutely. And I, I think that uh, we have just uh, time for the last, last uh, question or comment that is really practical. And uh, should all the patients post-transplant receive a DEXA scan at six months or only specific indications like persistent secondary hyperparathyroidism? Uh, what is your opinion after that? I, I will tell you what uh, we are doing in our center. Uh, since we have uh, both uh, at discharge at our hospital and at one year, uh, I think that I know enough to, to see that as I showed in, uh, in Jürgensen's uh, or at least the uh, the Belgian group's uh, study, uh, you don't really know uh, if one is starting with a low uh, bone uh, low DEXA might go up or, or if they're starting high or going down. Of course, you will know a bit of, uh, whether they had um, tertiary hyperparathyroidism before coming in, what were the, state, the status, and also you'll know by uh, the bone turnover markers. But still, uh, I think to do more than one DEXA in the first uh, year, one or two years is uh, valuable because then you know what trajectory this patient follows. Uh, and I would uh, advocate that uh, it's, you, it's of use to, to do DEXA in all patients at least once after transplants and then not too early. Yeah. Um, honestly speaking, what are, are we doing in our, uh, in our center? But because we don't evaluate DEXA before the, the transplant uh, is to make an evaluation uh, around one month after uh, after transplantation and to repeat it after one year of transplantation mm -hmm. just because it's the the, the most uh, stressing period 
Uh, and then uh, if there are n- no particular uh, clinical problems uh, related, uh, um, uh, we evaluate it every two years after that. Uh, but um, and, um, Mark uh, and, uh, and Daryl in your department, are you using it? The Texas scans. Yeah. Yeah, we do use it. Okay. Yes, after the first year, uh, we use it. Awesome. Just after the first year. Okay, so I, I think that time is gone. We have the one. We are one minute later, and uh, <laughs> so I think that we have to conclude our uh, uh, seminar. I I'm really happy because I think that. Uh, uh, we have touched a really important clinical problem, and um, and uh, this uh, and also this uh, seminar was made by two working group of the of the RA in collaboration. So I think it's really a good thing. Uh, so I thank uh, you, uh, Hedge, and also obviously Errol and Mark.